Uh, again, for those of you who weren't in the first session, uh, my name is Stephen Klingman. Uh, I'm a professor of English and also a director of the Interdisciplinary Studies Institute. Uh, we had a wonderful first session uh, with uh, um, uh, talks by Esther Terry and Janetta Cole and Equim Michael Thelwell. Uh, and no doubt there are questions out there in the audience and we hope the conversation will continue. Um, I've been asked by Rhonda Cobham Sander at uh, Amherst College to announce that there'll be, uh, that Binyavanga Wainana uh, will be with us next week, and there'll be a facilitated conversation on Wednesday morning with him from 8 to 10 a.m. in the Frost Library, and then a reading uh, again at Amherst College uh, in Fairweather Hall on Wednesday, 21st October at 6 p.m. So there's a lot going on and the World Studies Interdisciplinary Program has wonderful things coming up next week. So there's a lot going on on this campus at present. So welcome to our first panel discussion uh, featuring Oke Ndebe, uh, Carol Phillips and Chico Onigwe. Um, it's a session entitled, It is the Storyteller Who Makes Us What We Are. And if you look in your program, you will see that um, each session has a particular um, um, phrase or sentence uh, associated with it, and most of those are direct quotations from Chinua Achebe. One of them is a sort of paraphrase, but it captures the spirit of something occurring in one of Chinua Achebe's novels. There's a kind of, um, you can test yourself, you can see whether you know where those quotations come from. Uh, my plan here is not to say too much about our distinguished panelists. I'd rather hear from them than about them. But I do want to say that we're honored to have them here today. Um, and again, if you weren't in the first session, our aim is to commemorate Chinua Achebe's remarkable lecture of 40 years ago, but also to hear from contemporary voices. And that's the direction that we begin to move in at the moment. Um, and two of our writers, at least two, uh, will have known Chinua Achebe directly. Uh, and all of them will have deep, been deeply influenced by the paths opened up by his legacy. I'll plan to say just a few words about all of them, all three in a row, and then they will take it in turns to come up and speak for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll uh, plan to have time for Q&A afterwards. So I'll begin with Oke Ndebe, who's the author of the novels Arrows of Rain and Foreign Gods, Inc., uh, a truly wonderful novel, Foreign Gods, Inc. Both of them are wonderful, but Foreign Gods, Inc. was, was really widely, uh, widely uh, celebrated, uh, named as one of the top 10 or most remarkable books of 2014 by numbers of sources, including NPR and the New York Times. O.K. Mbebe worked for many years as an editorial writer for the Hartford Current, where he was a prize-winning journalist. And he's written also for the New York Times, BBC Online, Al Jazeera Online, and the Financial Times. Key point here, and I'll try to say something personal about each of these writers, is that OK has a double connection with the symposium and with Amherst. One, because he came to Amherst at the invitation of Chinua Achebe to be the founding editor of African Commentary, which Chinua Achebe published. Yes. And secondly, equally praiseworthy, he earned both his MFA and PhD, degree, PhD degrees from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, indeed from our department, the English department. In fact, if I remember correctly, I was on and may have chaired both of his committees. So I won't claim his work as my own, but it is a special pleasure to welcome OK back and to hear the unusual perspectives he will have. Carol Phillips, also a particular pleasure to have him here. Uh, Carol Phillips was born in St. Kitts, uh, but grew up uh, mostly in, the, in Leeds in the north of England and later attended Oxford University. He's become since then, and this is my view, one of the most significant writers of our time. And that's not only my view, mine, but many others as well. With 10 quite remarkable novels to date, including Cambridge, The Nature of Blood, A Distant Shore, and his most recent work, The Lost Child, a remarkable work. He is also a prolific essay writer, and his nonfiction volumes include The European Tribe, The Atlantic Sound, A New World Order, and Color Me English. Actually, the title uh, piece of which he gave as a presentation in this very room in 2010, if I recall correctly. His work has been translated into more than a dozen languages, and he's won numerous awards, including the Martin Luther King Memorial Prize and the Commonwealth Writers Prize. I've known 
Carol Phillips, ever since he was a writer in residence at Amherst College, I've written on his work, I've interviewed him. When we first conceived the symposium, I knew that he would be a perfect speaker for it. We're really happy to welcome you here, Kaz. Then I have to say that I met Chico Nigue for the first time today, so I don't, haven't known her personally, but I do know her through her work, and what I know is enthralling. Ms. Nigue was born in Enugu, Nigeria. She has degrees from the University of Nigeria and the Catholic University of Leuven. She also holds a PhD from the University of Leiden in Holland. She's the author of three novels, including On Black Sister Street, published in 2009 and then republished in 2011, and Night Dancer, published in 2012. Her short stories have appeared in several literary journals and her works have been translated into various languages, including German, Japanese, Hebrew, Italian, Hungarian, Spanish, and Dutch. As I say, I've come to know Chica Unigwe through her work. Some of you will know it too, and if you don't know it yet, then you'll soon have the pleasure of being introduced to a writer of rare perception, clarity, and insight. So, welcome to all three. And what we'll do now is that we'll begin with OK. He will come up and speak for 10 to 20 minutes, uh, followed by Karen Phillips and then Chica. And then we'll have Q&A at the table over there. Thanks a lot. Um, good afternoon. We're going to do better than this. Good afternoon. Much better. Actually, this is um, part of a cultural prescription. I come from a culture where you can't begin to address any audience um, without offering salutation. And if you gave a greeting and you didn't get a response, that would be a very polite way of saying to you, take a hike. <laughs> so, so I always make sure that I'm welcome to speak. Um, this is, for me, particularly uh, an extraordinary and moving event, but one that also makes me nervous um, because as Professor Klingman rightly said, um, he and several of uh, the other members of faculty at this uni great university were responsible for my education. So when you stand up before your teachers to speak, there is that sense of trepidation that perhaps you will fall short and therefore disappoint them. Uh, Michael Thurwell, who gave a wonderful keynote um, I consider a great teacher, um, and there are a number of you here who um, were part of my intellectual and creative formation. Um, Chinu Achebe, I did not have the privilege of taking any classes with, but I actually tell people that Chinu Achebe was my greatest teacher. And so when I, uh, Professor Klingman asked me to uh, propose sort of the focus of my talk, I suggested the color knot that Chino Achebe gave me. The color knot that Chino Achebe gave me. Those of you who were here when uh, Professor Roland Abiodu gave a wonderful invocation uh, will remember what he said, that the color knot is a quintessential storyteller in Igbo tradition. I'm very fortunate to be Igbo, just like Chino Achebe. Um, when somebody visits you, you give the person a color knot but to eat in your home, but one always to take home. And what the person says is that when the colonel gets home, it will tell its story. And so the colonel becomes a provocation to narrative. Um, once somebody returns from a journey, he calls together his friends because colonel is also a knot of communion. You don't eat it alone. You eat it with, um, with your friends in a community. So you gather your friends and you say, I went to visit my great friend, Stephen Klingman, and he gave me this color knot. So um, what I propose to do really is in the tradition of storytelling to sort of describe the trajectory of my uh, intellectual and creative formation and how Chino Achebe was seminal uh, in that process. Uh, and I'm going to do this as a writer, as a storyteller, through stories. 
So I first met Chinua Achebe um, when I was in high school, secondary school, we called it in Nigeria. And of course, we were lucky, we were fortunate. I was actually uh, the first set uh, in Nigeria to be allowed to read for our school certificate exams, African literature. Our predecessors were exposed mostly to Victorian literature. So as my time came, they offered us African literature on the curriculum. And so I was, um, I had read things all apart before then, but for the first time in a formal setting, I encountered things fall apart again. And so one day during the um, holiday, I was doing what young men do, hanging out by the roadside, and we saw from the distance a rather remarkable car coming in our direction. It was a blue car, it was huge, and so we became attentive. As the car passed us, we looked and saw that it was Chinua Achebe driving an American maker, a monarch. And so, indifferent to danger, we jumped onto the road and began to wave at him. And we saw him raise his hand in acknowledgement. Achebe had made our week. And so every, this was a Saturday, so every Saturday we'll come to the roadside and just hang out there, hoping that Chino Achebe will be passing. And some weeks we were lucky. We'll see Achebe now from the distance. We recognize the car and the color, so we'll start waving before he actually passed us. Then one day, I was just wandering around alone, passing a gas station in this town where I lived, and here was Chino Achebe buying fuel. And so again, with great dread, I walked up to him and I said, good afternoon, sir. And he said, good afternoon. So I ran back to my friends. And I said, I would be waving to Chinua Achebe, that, but today I met him in flesh and blood. I said good afternoon to him, and he responded. So I served them notice that for the next two weeks, I wasn't going to talk to anybody else. <laughs> Several years later, as a fresh college graduate, I went, I just finished college. I got a job with a Concord newspaper. Um, and I was to resume, uh, take up the position in about a couple of weeks. So I was seeing friends, and I went to visit a friend who was from Ogidi, Chinua Achebe's hometown. And I kept raving. I said, look, I wish I were from Ogidi so that I could claim Chinua Achebe as my own. And so this woman looked at me with wry amusement, and she said, do you know that Chinua Achebe is my uncle? I said, you don't mean it. And she said, in fact, his house is around the corner. I said, you don't mean it. And she said, and he's home this weekend. Would you want to meet him? So she took me to Chinua Achebe's home. I still remember the Coca-Cola that Chinua Achebe offered me. Some kind of cola, European cola, right? <laughs> and some cookies. So I told Achebe that I had just finished college and I got a job with a magazine and that my dream would be to interview him. I had read everything he'd written several times over. So Achebe gave me his number at the University of Nigeria where he was a professor then and said, anytime you're ready, call me. So I, I came to Lagos to take up the position and I told the editor that I had met Chinua Achebe and he would give me an interview. So he said to me, that's your first assignment. So the magazine sent me out, flew me out to Enugu. I booked an interview with Achebe and we met at his office at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Nigeria. And for almost three hours, I kept asking questions. And the tape recorder was picking it all up. Then I returned to Enugu. And some of my friends came to my hotel room, hotel presidential. They wanted to listen to Achebe's voice. I was happy to share. So I pressed play. And there was silence. I, fought, I, 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 I um, went forward, press play, play again, not a word. I had interviewed Achebe for close to three hours and I didn't have one word from his mouth to prove it. So in panic, I called him. I said, I'm sorry I wasted all your time, but the interview that you gave me, I didn't get one word from it. And I was so in awe as the man spoke that I didn't even take notes. I was just looking at him. So I said, could I come back tomorrow? I said, just give me 20 minutes because I know I wasted your time. 20 minutes will suffice. Because if I went back to Lagos without any interview at all, 
I would lose my job even before I started. And those of you who met Achebe in life knew that he was such a generous and gracious man. And Achebe said to me, I can't do it tomorrow, but if you can come the day after tomorrow, I'll give you as much time as you wanted. So I had to borrow money to stay another couple of extra days at the hotel because the money that the magazine gave me had run out. Then I ran around and borrowed two other tape recorders. <laughs> so I was armed with three. And I went two days later, and Achebe gave me as much time as I wanted. So Chino Achebe saved my professional career. <laughs> Not only did he do this, but he became a champion of my work. Uh, I was flattered that Achebe would write to me uh, from time to time and say, you know, a poem of mine has been set to music. He'll write, you know, send me a letter to that effect. So I'll write up a story in the papers. And so in 1988, I was um, working for the Guardian, uh, African Guardian, a weekly magazine in Lagos. One day I came to work and the secretary said, oh, Chino Achebe called you from the US. He said you should call him back. Um, so I called Achebe back and he says, is there a private place where I could hope, have a conversation with you? I said, yes. So I gave him we didn't have cell phones in those days, so I had a friend who had a business, so I gave him the number. So Achebe, on the appointed day, told me that he and some other friends had decided to set up a magazine in America, and he had pro proposed me as a founding editor of the magazine. So Chino Achebe brought me to this country to edit this magazine. And in bringing me, he then offered me this great harvest both of knowledge and of people. And a lot of the people that I know today, I knew from my days as an editor of African Commentary. And some of the people in this room were indeed uh, editorial columnists for the magazine, especially uh, somebody like Michael Thurwell. And so the magazine came to this country, and it's important because Michael Thurwell and I were outside a moment ago answering questions about the continuing depiction of Africa in very unflattering terms. Achebe recognized this, and Achebe recognized that it was his place to do something about it, hence his investment in this magazine, African Commentary. Well, the magazine won prizes in this country, was chosen by Otner Reader, the Library Journal, as one of the best magazines that came out in America. But we were not able to impress the publishing industry, I mean the uh, advertising industry in New York. So when we looked for advertisement, we were told that black people don't read serious magazines, you guys are too intellectual, so you are bound to fail. And that became self-fulfilling prophecy because they would not support the magazine with advertising dollars. The magazine, after a while, Achebe and the other investors who were almost exclusively professors, academics who didn't have a lot. The magazine had to fold. So after I folded, one day I ran into John Edgar Wideman in the center of town. And John looked at me and said, so now that the magazine is no longer in operation, what are you planning to do? I didn't know, so I confess that I didn't know what my next plans were. And looking at me intensely in the eye, he said to me, you are working on a novel, right? I wasn't working on a novel. <laughs> but the way he asked the question, I somehow felt that they, it was imperative that the answer better be yes. So I said yes. So he said to me, Mike Farewell and I have been talking about perhaps getting you into UMass to do a program. Why don't you get me 15 to 20 pages of your manuscript and let's see if we can get you into the MFA program. Well, I lied myself into writing. So that night I began to write, scribbling something that I didn't know whether it resembled a novel or not. But the following week I sent 23 pages that I had come up with. And the only thing really that I fell back on was the fact that I had been well educated in my reading of Shinno Achebe's work, in my reading of the incompar incomparable harvest that, it, that, was it, that is the African Writers Series. So that whole tradition 
was what informed what became my first novel, Arrows of Rain. And in the acknowledgement page of that novel, I thank Chinua Achebe for opening my eyes to the beauty of our stories. And it was a heartfelt acknowledgement and compliment. Well, so two days later, John Edgar Whiteman called me and he said, wow, I really find what you produced captivating and fascinating, he said. I said, whoa, so <laughs> it resembles fiction after all. And so he said, um, we'll see, you'd have to take your GRE and Esther Terry was part of that whole process, actually, uh, I remember. Um, but I was able to get um, admission uh, to study for my MFA uh, in the English department on the passport of wonderful people that Chinua Achebe had introduced to me through the work that he invited me to come to this country to do. And so, again, when I was invited to speak, and Professor Klingman said, you know, every person will speak for 15 minutes. I said, uh-huh. I'm somebody who is usually constitutionally incapable of brevity. But when the subject is Chinua Achebe, I tell people, when Chinua Achebe died, an interviewer called me and said, what is the one thing that you most, one quality about Chinua Achebe that you most remember? And I said that Achebe was a wise and eloquent man. But I said, Achebe was a man who never wasted one word. When Achebe gave a lecture, if the lecture was written in 2,000 words, it would be impossible for any editor, the best editor in the world, to remove one word. Achebe did not waste words because Achebe treasured words and he realized the importance, the power, the potency of words, the importance of language. And he used language in, a, in the most effective way. Achebe did not have Kant in him. Achebe did not have affectation for his own sake. Achebe was not a writer who was interested in lying. A lot of times, it is when we want to lie that we become extremely verbose because you have to garnish and embellish and embroider lies. When you tell the truth, you tell it in exactly the number of words that it takes to tell the truth. And so I stand here today uh, in celebration of Chinua Achebe, who years ago as a high school student gave me that colonnade of a great literary tradition, gave me that powerful colonnade of encouraging me to have to claim the voice for telling my own story. Thank you, Chinua Achebe for making it possible for me to realize that a novel could begin with the words or conquer was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. That his fame rested on solid personal achievement. That as a young man of 18, he brought honor to his village by throwing Amalinze the cat. That Amalinze was a great wrestler who for eight years was unbeaten from Omorphia to Mbaino that he was called a cat because his back would never touch the earth, and so on and so forth. I would not have imagined that Amalinze the cat, which was part of the folklore that we grew up on. Again, one was fortunate. I tell people that I was fortunate not to have TV growing up. And so every night after dinner, my parents or some uncle or aunt would sit the children on the floor and tell us a folktale if I had been left to my own knowledge, I would never have known that those folk tales could be transported to the world of great literature. It took Achebe's magic, Achebe's extraordinary and incomparable imagination to bring that truth back to me, home to me. And so, um, I don't know how much time I've got. Uh, am I out of time? Okay, I've actually on occasion been known, and maybe today is gonna to be one of those rare, rare occasions, since Achebe was a man who never wasted a word, right? How about in his memory, in his honor, 
I leave some time on the table. How about that? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It works. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to thank Stephen Klingman and uh, everybody associated with the Interdisciplinary Studies Institute for this invitation to speak today. Um, as Stephen mentioned, five years ago, I spent a wonderful week here in residence at the Institute, and at the end of the week, I resolved to try and learn from the experience and step outside of the departmental box in which I usually hide, in my case, an English departmental box. Um, I think I've done a little of this, but probably not enough. But whatever I've done has been, in great part, led by the example of this institute. So thank you, Stephen. I know this is a panel discussion, a panel session, and I don't want to take up too much time as the focus is supposed to be on discussion. But I do want to say a few things about Chinwa Achebe, which hopefully resonates somewhat with our title. It is a storyteller who makes us see what we are. I've been thinking about this title and have come to the conclusion that in the case of Chinwa Achebe, he was also a storyteller who made us see who we are, or at least he certainly did in my case. I make the distinction between what and who as a way of suggesting that a personal encounter with him is likely to engender a transformation that's at least as profound as one we might receive by reading the remarkable body of his work. He was such an extraordinarily charismatic man, and having had the privilege of knowing him a little, I would like to speak about both what we are because of his example and more specifically who we are or who I am because of personal encounter. First, Chinwa Achebe is a storyteller whose very existence made it possible for a whole generation of writers to imagine that it might be possible for them to begin to think of themselves as writers. From 1958 onwards, his face was there on book jackets, in the newspaper columns, as part of an ongoing global literary conversation. And he established a presence at a very young age for a writer. As we know, Things Fall Apart quickly became a worldwide publishing sensation. And not too long afterwards, there was a canonical intervention, as syllabi and university courses had to be sometimes reluctantly cantilevered into new shapes and groupings to include Achebe and his work and the work of others like him. His example was audacious and it was bold, but it was extremely important for writers need elders. They need to be able to see those who have gone before them, who have established a presence. Without rehearsing the details, of the emergence of African literature in the West, it's clear that somebody had to kick open the heavy forbidding door to the literary and publishing world and make it possible for others to imagine that there might also be a place for them to come inside and sit down at the table and participate. And we know full well who that man was. Chinwa Achebe knew from very early on that he bore a great responsibility for he was part of a generation of writers in English, which includes Derek Walcott, Ngugi Wationgo, Wale Shainka, Wilson Harris, George Lamming, amongst many others, who had to develop equal fluency in both imaginative and critical writing, for they were having to write themselves into visibility. They all chose fiction and non-fiction. It was a generation in which it was pointless to make a distinction between the validity of both because both were crucial as these writers tried hard to invent themselves. Achebe, of course, famously took an extra step as the editor of the Heinemann African Writers Series, 
and was responsible for ushering over 100 books into print. Achebe understood his solemn responsibility to others, both past and present, but he was fully aware that others would come after him, and he was assiduously clearing a space for them, and he continued to do so throughout the length of his life and his career. That, in a sense, is the what we are. This storyteller certainly made all of us, ordinary citizens and would-be writer alike, more clearly see both what we are and what we might become. When I think of the who we are, the more personal relationship, if you like, I have to recognize appropriately enough, given the timing of this present gathering, that it was a Achebe's battle with Conrad that really forged whatever connection there was between us. We didn't overlap during the eight years that I spent teaching here in Amherst. I arrived in the fall of 1990, the same year that Chinua had his terrible car accident, and nearly three years after the death of James Baldwin. But the spirit of both writers was still very much in the UMass air. Their wisdom, their brilliance, their contribution, I suppose the best word to use here would be legacy. The legacy of their tenure at UMass was being kept alive by stories of their lectures, the classes they taught here, by the accounts of those who had been fortunate enough to be their students, by their colleagues and their friends, principally, of course, by Professor Michael Thelwell. It would be over 10 years, in fact, not until early 2003, before I would finally have the privilege of meeting Chinua Achebe in person. The BBC in London asked me if I would agree to participate in a half-hour film documentary with him, which would involve my being an interviewer and with the focus being upon Achebe's life as a writer. Of course, I said yes and readily agreed to drive up to Bard College with the director and whatever crew he brought with him from London. I also suggested that I arrange for a small group of my Barnard College students to travel up with another teacher in a minibus and therefore create a sort of informal seminar setting and provide us with an audience. I assumed that Mr. Achebe might enjoy the company of a group of young New York-based undergraduates, forgetting, of course, that he had plenty of undergraduates at Bard College to keep him company. But he graciously agreed to the proposal and the small caravan, my car and the minibus, took off through the snow and full of eager anticipation, we made the journey from Manhattan to Annandale on Hudson. As it transpired, there were two parts to the day. The first involved shooting the filmed interview with him for the documentary, which we eventually called The Power of Stories. We did the filming in his home in a rather cramped corner of the living room, which was soon filled with eight or nine young women sitting cross-legged on the floor, notebooks in their laps and pens hovering eagerly. Christy, Mr. Achebe's wife, had made sure that everybody had taken off their shoes and not walked snow into her house. And I still bristle with embarrassment, realizing that I had probably been the chief, perhaps the only potential offender, for I remember her looking pointedly at me as she laid down the law. <laughs> Anybody who has been involved in filming knows that it's a mind-bogglingly tedious process and requires great reservoirs of patience should you be the subject. As the director proceeded to rearrange the furniture in the Achebe household and plug out various appliances to free up sockets into which the crew might plug their own equipment, Chinua looked on with great vigilance and a butter-like calm and then asked me what exactly I thought we might talk about. I had been deliberately vague in my exchanges with both himself and the director, wanting to give him the space to set the agenda. However, being a very generous man, he in turn was reciprocating and letting me know that I should take things in whatever direction I wished. And so with the students seated at his feet, we began and spoke for what felt like hours, but was in fact little more than an hour and a half breaking off only to check that the film recording was working or for Chinua to have a sip of water. It hardly needs stating how mesmerizing he was. 
But what people who have never had the good fortune to know him probably don't realize is just how mischievously witty he could be. In fact, I love the opening of the essay that forms the basis of this symposium. I'll just read the first couple of lines. In the fall of 1974, I was walking one day from the English department of the University of Massachusetts to a parking lot. It was a fine autumn morning, such as encouraged friendliness in passing strangers. Brisk youngsters were hurrying in all directions, many of them obviously freshmen, in their first flush of enthusiasm. An older man going the same way as I turned and remarked to me how very young they came these days. I agreed. Then he asked me if I was a student too. I said no, I was a teacher. What did I teach? African literature. Now that was funny, he said, because he knew a fellow who taught the same thing, or perhaps it was African history in a certain community college not far from here. It always surprised him, he went on to say, because he'd never thought of Africa as having that kind of stuff, you know. By this time, I was walking much faster. <laughs> now, good comedy requires good timing. And during the interview, I learned that Chinua was a master of the rhetorical pause. As he spoke, the students gawped and they scribbled in turn. He took his time with every question. He raised his finger to gently emphasize a point and he smiled to soften the blow of any corrective opinion he was about to deliver. It was clear that I was lucky to be in the presence of a master teacher and appropriately enough, given our present location, the only other time I've ever felt this compulsion that I should sit, listen and learn in the presence of another writer was when I first sat and talked with James Baldwin in the south of France back in the summer of 1983. Once the filmed interview was over and the adoring students had had their books signed and their photographs taken, they all trudged out into the snow. However, I continued to talk with Chinua and this time raised the subject of Conrad, who, surprisingly enough, had not been discussed in the film documentary. The BBC crew were ready to leave, but it was clear to me that there was unfinished business. Chinua had more to say, and so as the light began to fade, we moved to a more central part of the room, and the second part of our encounter began. Without cameras rolling, or students taking notes, now I was the student, for I began scribbling in a notebook. I won't bore you with the details of the conversation, for I made enough notes and my memory held up well enough for me to be able to write an essay about Achebe and Conrad, which was soon after published in the Guardian newspaper. But what I will say, however, is that on that late wintry afternoon, our difference of opinion about Conrad seemed to revolve around the simple fact, well, not so simple actually, seemed to revolve around the fact that I was not an African and therefore I didn't take Heart of Darkness personally, which Chinua obviously did. The more I listened to Chinua talk, the more it became clear to me that the key to understanding Achebe on Conrad involves accepting the notion that the essay is perhaps not so much about Conrad's opinions about African people as it is about Chinua's love and respect for his own people. I was listening to a man who had probably been an elder before he was out of short pants. And as he spoke, I remembered all the cultural apparatus which, as a black boy growing up in England, had cast and set images of Africa in my own mind. That afternoon, I didn't change my opinion of Conrad, but I began to rethink my diasporan relationship to Africa and by extension to the whole African diasporan family. Suddenly it became a much more fractured and difficult familial relationship, less romantic, more nuanced, and more challenging in all sorts of positive ways. Of course, I thereafter did what anybody would do in these circumstances, and I began to read, reread all of Chinua Achebe's work, and I could clearly see his ongoing frustrations with Western media images of Africa, as well as his own impatience with Nigerian and African politics and the way in which some behaviors were contributing towards perpetuating negative images of Africa in the West. 
I read him on James Baldwin and his poignant memories of first reading Baldwin in the Nigeria of the 1960s and then finally meeting him in Florida in 1980. I was very powerfully struck by his account of his difficulties on meeting some African diaspora writers, particularly Ralph Ellison, with whom he clearly did not get on. And this in turn made me remember Chinwa's anecdotes about V.S. Naipaul, who he referred to, always with a big smile on his face, as my friend Naipaul. <laughs> Rereading Achebe made me realize that like every great teacher, everything he said to me on that late wintry afternoon had already been distilled and taken on board over many years of careful thinking and writing. Yet he presented it to me as though his conclusions had been provoked by being in conversation with me. And these conclusions had been freshly arrived at for my benefit. And of course, they had not. But rereading him and being reminded of this fact served only to make the encounter all the more precious. Two years later, in 2005, I shared a platform with Chinua at the Royal Festival Hall in London. When we came out on stage, he received a tumultuous standing ovation, which the director of the center later told me had never happened before for any other writer over a period of 50 years. What the upstanding audience didn't know was that I had no, absolutely no idea of what direction this evening's conversation might go in. For as we had hovered in the wings ready to go on, I had assumed that we would rehearse some of the issues that I had already talked with him about, principally, of course, his long tussle with Heart of Darkness. As the stage manager signaled that we should step forward and into the light, I suggested this subject matter to him. He looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and he said, tonight, we can talk about anything, but not Conrad. Enough of Conrad. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a privilege to be here, so I'd like to start by saying thank you to Professor Klingman and the ISI for having me here. But it's also um, a bit intimidating to um, stand here after OK and Kaz have so eloquently spoken. Um, storytelling. This is a true story. In this story, the girl has tightly plaited hair, gathered on top of her head in an intricate style, and decorated with a dozen multicolored bubbles. It looks like a miniature brightly decorated Christmas tree. So we will call this girl Christmas. Christmas is eight years old, or maybe nine. It doesn't matter. We're less concerned with the preciseness of her age than we are with the fact that she's a child. Another important fact about Christmas is this. She's a greedy reader with an appetite for books that stuns even her own parents. And this appetite is encouraged not just by her parents, but by the numerous well-intentioned adults who surround her. Another important fact, this child, Christmas, her literary tastes haven't yet developed. Therefore, in addition to reading the um, Enid Blyton books her parents bring back from holidays in London and America, she reads everything else she stumbles upon the romance novels her older sister has discovered and reads sighing and mourning on her bed, um, the literature books her older siblings are prescribed by school to read, and the Ian Fleming Bond novels with long delightful titles that her brothers read while listening to Bob Marley and Uroy, and the books with beautiful black women on their covers, but with stories of women with eyes like dolls, so blue, red, green, um, hazel eyes, waiting to be rescued by tall, dark, and by dark I mean tanned, um, knights in shining armor, a certain social aunt brings her. And on the day this story begins, the social aunt is visiting, and as usual she has a book for Christmas. It's a small, well-thumbed book. On its cover is a striking, frightening illustration of a long-tailed, two-horned, charcoal-black devil with glowing eyes, 
and a three-pronged pitchfork. As a child, as is the case with most people who become writers, I was a voracious reader. I read everything from bread labels to newspapers in hospital waiting rooms. I had no literary fancies. My parents bought me age-appropriate books, but they were not the only ones who invested in my reading. And the danger in a young child reading indiscriminately is this. Sometimes they read things that are so unwieldy, they lie awake at night, pondering over them. Sometimes they read things that they cannot speak about that cause them um, brain trauma, psychogenic amnesia, I think it's called. But psychogenic amnesia, like all amnesia, can be selective. You can forget the title of the book, but not that you stayed up many nights afterwards praying for your soul, or that for a long time you believed the truths of that book. In this story, Christmas takes the book from the aunt and goes to her favorite reading spot, a long red couch under a framed, long-haired Jesus with benevolent blue eyes and hands spread out, calling all to his sacred heart. And the heart is red and surrounded by rays of light. There is something comforting about the heart and about lying on the couch right under that heart. Christmas always feels safe on that couch. She ignores the cover which slightly unnerves her and begins to read. The book isn't more than 50 pages long and begins innocuously enough by quoting the book of Genesis. And on the sixth day, God created man saying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The book emphasizes that man was made in God's likeness and God's likeness, as we see in, in illustrations of Jesus, one of which is above the girl's head, is Caucasian. And then the next chapters go on to tell the story of Cain and Abel and how Cain kills Abel out of jealousy and is punished by God with a mark on his forehead. So far, the story is familiar to the girl. And then, bam. The mark that Cain gets on his forehead, signaling him out, as a murderer and cursed for generations by God isn't really just a mark um, as the girl has always thought, but a skin color. That mark is the black skin. And that curse lives in every descendant of Cain. And these descendants are distinguishable, of course, by the color of their skin, according to the book that Christmas reads. And the author goes on to list all the tragedies that have befallen the black race, those descendants of Cain from slavery to wars, bad governments in Africa, as manifestations of the curse. The only thing Christmas is perhaps more passionate about than reading and writing is her soul. She wants more than anything to go to heaven in the future, where she's been told that there'll be an abundance of walls, vanilla ice cream, and rooms full of books. And now she's reading that no matter how good she is, no matter how hard she tries, her soul is already doomed. There is no saving her, it seems, from perdition. I was raised in a very strict Catholic home, and the tussle for our souls was between the devil and my parents, and my parents were determined to win. And so everything, or almost everything, was censored. If the wrong kind of music came on the radio, it was turned off. And at a certain point, um, Salt and Peppers, Let's Talk About Sex, Baby, was my favorite. So let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. But um, the only way I could sing about it was to replace sex with bread. So I'll go, let's talk about bread, baby. <laughs> let's talk about all the good things and the bad things we could bake. No. <laughs> the day my mother caught one of my sisters wearing a t-shirt with the print, Fantastic in Dark Places, um, my sister got two choices, to bend the shirt or to iron over the print. My sister who liked the shirt for the image of one of her favorite bands on its front had to iron another print over the fantastic in dark places so that the message was garbled, made no grammatical sense. But my mother, who is um, punctilious about proper grammar, did not mind. Better to enter heaven with proper grammar than to dance Sorry, better to enter heaven with bad grammar than to dance all the way into hell with your eyes and with your eyes dotted and your teeth crossed. 
Whatever films we watched on video were bought by my parents. Jesus of Nazareth, parts one to four, Sound of Music, King and I. And when the, video, when, um, the first video club opened in Enugu where we lived and all our friends joined, we were not allowed to because my parents could not be expected to watch every movie and decide whether it was right for us or not. The only sphere we had a certain kind of freedom was in what we read. My parents believed in the redeeming value of books. They encouraged us to read. They expected their friends who bought us books to choose books that were appropriate for us. There was no need to censor those. Sometimes I told them exciting things I had read. Sometimes I wrote my own stories, spin-offs mostly of what I had read, especially in the Enid Blyton books. And so I wrote about white children eating apples and having adventures Blyton's characters had. They had grandmothers who baked cakes because as far as I was concerned, those were the only kind of characters valid enough to occupy books. And all writing begins with imitation after all. My imitation lacked the scope to include characters like me or, or a grandmother like mine who came from the village with bags of cocoa and guava covered in sand. And who would have thought that wearing an apron while cooking was a silly indulgence? For many nights after reading the book with the devil on its cover, Christmas cannot sleep. When she tries to speak of this book to her parents, her tongue cleaves to her mouth and she cannot find the words. She doesn't have the maturity to question the injustice of being sent to hell for nothing she's done. She's always thought, thought of the written word as sacred. Books, like parents, do not lie. The written world is too full of integrity to lie. And so it doesn't occur to her to question the legitimacy of the facts that she has read. At night, she's haunted by the image of the devil chasing her with his pitchfork and mocking her. She begins to bed wet because she's too afraid, too burdened to get up at night to use the bathroom. She sleeps with the lights on, but it does very little to relieve her. She dreams of waking up miraculously white. If there was a way that she could scrub off her skin, no matter how, how long it took, she would do it. She tallies up all her good deeds, not lying, not cheating on tests, even when the opportunities are there, praying, refusing, to bribe, refusing the bribe given to her by an older sister with whom she goes to church, to skip church for an afternoon visit at a friend's. These are sacrifices she makes so that she would be assured heaven. But she sees how all those deeds, all her goodness fall, limpid and inconsequential, beside the fate that is already sealed by Cain's murderous deed. If being good cannot save her, then what can? I grew up in a middle class family, and what this means in practical terms is that I had access to good schools. One of the distinguishing features of a good school then, and I'm fairly sure it's still the same in, um, it's still the same in present day Nigeria, is that the use of vernacular is prohibited. You were punished, you were punished for using any language but English at school. In high school, French was compulsory as a second language. We learned enough French to write essays. And in our final year, the three major Nigerian languages were introduced for the first time, but we were only supposed to learn how to count from one to 10. Nobody expected any of us to write exams in Igbo, Hausa, or Yoruba. I doubt any of us, even those of us who spoke our local languages fluently, would have been able to write a meaningful essay in them. At school, in social studies class, we learned that the wife of a British administrator or his mistress named Nigeria. We learned that a European explorer, Mongo Park, discovered the river Niger. Whatever we learned of Nigerians taking an active part in Nigeria was limited to the patriots who fought for our independence in 1960. It was almost as if before then, before the English came in 1849 to colonize it, Nigeria was a huge void where nothing and nobody existed. And the road to rectifying this one-sided view of history is far. A few years ago, I ran a workshop for middle school students in three different schools in Nigeria, in Port Harcourt. These three were all very good schools. They were all private schools. 
the students spent holidays in London and America. In each school, I asked um, the students to write the opening paragraph of a short story, introducing their protagonist to the reader. Without fail, all their protagonists had Western names. When we worked on settings, um, all their protagonists were in a foreign, non-African country. So I changed tactics. I gave them the opening sentence. I made sure to use Nigerian names so that there would be no ambiguity. To my dismay, I still had Bola with blue eyes, long silky hair, <laughs> and a straight pointed nose. That was when it struck, me, it struck me how deeply rooted the problem was. Adichie had published Purple Hibiscus by then. Farafina was publishing novels by Nigerian writers accessible to middle school students from homes where their parents could afford to buy those books. And yet, a majority of these students could not imagine people like themselves occupying the spaces in their own stories. It also occurred to me how lucky I was to have discovered Achebe when I did, and why such discoveries should not have to depend on luck. I made a concerted effort in those schools to challenge the students to read other books, to imitate other kinds of writers. By the end of the workshop, 99.9% .9 of them, I think, I hope, got it. And that is one of the most rewarding things I've ever done, by the way. Um, a short while later, a week, perhaps two weeks later, after reading that book whose title Christmas Has Forgotten, serendipity throws Achebe's things fall apart into her path. Reading it is like a spiritual experience. She'll recognize later when she's older and wiser how it saves her. This book that tells the story of a civilization and a community completely disrupted by the coming of the white man. Its protagonist, Okonkwa, is a warrior, a proud man, whose life is completely ruined by the clash of civilizations which is brought by the English colonizers. For the first time in her life, Christmas reads a book which shows that her ancestors' history does not begin with colonization, that her people had a world that was complete on its own and which did not seek validity outside of its own community. For the first time, colonization was presented as an intrusion and not as something she ought to be grateful for. Um. Achebe writes in Things Fall Apart, the white man is clever. He came quietly and peaceably with his religion. We are amused at his foolishness and allowed him to stay. Now he has won our brothers and our clan can no longer act as one. He has put a knife on the things that held us together and we have fallen apart. That line, that line even at that age stands out for her. It consoles her. Its power is so transformative that she begins to question the veracity of the history lessons she's learned at school. She begins to see how ridiculous it is that someone would name a people that already existed or discover a river that was not only already in existence but was being used by the locals. She also begins to understand the tragedy of punishing someone for speaking their mother tongue and to imagine a heaven from which her skin color does not preclude her and a world where everything she is, is enough. In a 1994 interview with the Paris Review, Achebe himself says, when I began going to school and learned to read, I encountered stories of other people and other lands. In one of my essays, I remember the kinds of things that fascinated me, weird things even, about a wizard who lived in Africa and went to China to find a lamp, fascinating to me because they were about things remote and almost ethereal. Um, then I grew older and began to read about adventures in which I didn't know that I was supposed to be on the side of those savages who were encountered by the good white man. I instinctively took sides with the white people. They were fine, they were excellent, they were intelligent. The others were not. They were stupid and ugly. That was the way I was introduced to the danger of not having your own stories. Once I realized that I had to be a writer, I had to be that historian. Discovering Achebe and his protagonists who have Igbo names and do things more identifiable um, to, to me than ice skating or your grandmother in an apron baking cakes 
introduced me to that danger Achebe spoke, up, spoke of. More importantly, it gave me the courage, or perhaps the license, to write my own stories. Nothing in all my experience of literature since has ever had as strong an effect on my sense of the sheer possibilities of writing. Christmas comes to reading, and therefore to writing with fresh eyes. She also begins to ask questions. There's a curiosity about the past that has been awakened in her, even about her own family's past, the grandfather she never met who converted to Christianity in adulthood and so began to eat cassava, which was considered Christian food. Her great-grandfather who was buried sitting down in the dead of the night because he was, a, he was a titled man, but only after the family had pretended to bury him in an empty coffin so as not to get into trouble with the colon, colonialists. There's a wealth of knowledge where she previously imagined none. Telling those stories, correcting the single story of Africa becomes important to Christmas too. Her early writings reflect this, a passionate insistence on writing about the past, as if the present does not or should not matter. It takes time and some maturity, and a transcontinental move and a homesickness that almost pulverizes her and becoming invincible, and becoming invisible before she realizes that the present and the future are as important as the past, and that in fiction, there is enough space for interrogations of not just how the other sees us, but how we see ourselves and how we see the other. And something else Christmas lends is this, that empathy for others, even others unlike yourself, can only be achieved when you begin to believe that you are as valid, as worthy of celebration as the other. For the writers who come after Achebe, there's a recognition of Achebe's role in making us not just writers, but the kind of writers that we are. In the words of Toni Morrison, he opened doors for us. From Flora Mwapa, who's a Furu published four years after things fall apart, gives us a female pr um, protagonist who is to a large extent antithetical to Okunko's wives and things fall apart, to a Mecheta who published in the 80s and continues the tradition of strong female protagonists to the present generation of writers, my fellow travelers, such audacious adventurers with such interpretity of, of vision, such heroic penchant for the tremendous, discombobulating the erstwhile notion of African literature, perhaps encouraged by Western theorists, um, as a homogeneous, almost anthropological genre, quite distinct from and certainly ranks lower than its Western counterpart, a particular kind of commodity for a particular market. There is less anxiety about how the world sees Africa than with how Africa sees itself. The relative explosion of African writers present on the global scene is not a coincidence. In a 2000 interview with Emenyonu, Achebe says that he hopes that the 21st century will bring African writing fully into the arena of world literature. This is the fulfilling of that hope. One of the most hopeful Igbo proverbs says that the chicken scratches ahead and scratches behind and asks her children which is better. Its implication is that the future is greater than the past or the present, and it's an honor for me to be an active participant in that. In this story, there is a happy ending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, OK, Kaz and Chika. Um, We'd like to throw it up into the audience right now. There are two microphones uh, which people can come up to. Um, and uh, because the acoustics in this room are not uh, of the best, uh, I'd, I'd advise using those microphones. Um, and as people think of things to say, I wondered if I could just uh, kick things off with, with one observation which comes out of your talks combined, actually. Um, because... Um, I was struck, something that I always quote from when I teach uh, Chino Achebe was, is his essay, The Novelist as Teacher, in which he says, I'm content to be a teacher. He says, you know, in certain versions of art, that's regarded as a kind of degraded version of art, that you're to be a teacher. But he said, I'm content to be a teacher. And each of you has spoken, in a way, about um, Chino Achebe as a teacher. Um, and some of it has been quite haunting, really, the sense of deeply buried images in one's unconscious, which you have to overcome uh, as you make your way forward in the world, and how liberating it can be to read certain kinds of writing. 
And I want to draw on something that Kaz said and then uh, uh, shift it in a certain direction. Uh, because in your talk, Kaz, you, you spoke about the, the what and the who. You know, what, what we are and, and who we are. But I wonder if we could also focus on the how. Uh, you know, what Chinua Achele might have taught in terms of how, how to be a writer. You know, each of us, all of us here in this room, we live in very different times now from the times that Chinua Achebe lived in. There are different issues to confront, different topics, different stories, different narratives to tell. But maybe one of the ways in which his spirit lives on is a sense of how to be responsible to one's time, to find those stories that need telling, um, and to, to do one's best to live up to them. So just to start things off, I wonder if that's uh, something that uh, each of you might reflect on, or whoever wants to take it up. Um, well, the, the, can you hear me? This works? OK. Um, well, the how question, I think, was, um, was central to Achebe's practice as a novelist and as an intellectual. Um, I said in my brief remarks that Chebe was a man who disdained affectation and pretentiousness, especially when it was in the service of itself. Um, Achebe believed that he had a particular patrimony, a particular cultural heritage, and therefore a particular lens that enabled him to see the world in its fullness and complexity. Um, and he sought for the tools to tell his story from within his Igbo cultural heritage. And that's a powerful witness. You know, so the way that Achebe told his story um, and the way that Achebe positioned himself uh, in relation to African history and memory, I think, uh, was always exemplary. Um, now, there are writers who are coming up who don't have accessible to them the same kind of cultural wealth um, that is rooted in, in Africa that Achebe had. Achebe was a man who received two kinds of education. Uh, an education, first of all, in his, in his, uh, in his tradition. So he was, um, when you encounter, encountered him, you felt like you were in the presence of an Igbo elder, primarily. But then he combined this with his intellectual, he was enlarged by his intellectual training also. But the magic of Achebe, the genius of Achebe, was how he was able to bring these two dimensions of his experience into, into harmony. Um, and so in doing this, I think that he, he instructed us um, about an organic way uh, of being a writer, of being responsive, of being always aware of your community um, and, and having that community in mind as you write and reflect on their experience. <laughs> Owner of words, yes. That is actually one of Achebe's titles. Owner of words. Do either of you want to take up that question? Um, I don't think I don't think I, I don't think any, I don't think I can improve upon what OK has said. I mean, it's um, I, I just had a PS. I think that the letter that Mike Felwell read that he sent to the Swedish Academy to me is a perfect example of how to be a writer. I, I think that um, for Achebe as well, what. I remember, I remember reading um, the essay you wrote after, after you spoke to Achebe, and you asked him, well, you know, is um, um, Heart of Darkness great art? And he said, no, it's not great art, because, you know, um, it has failed, it, it fails in its responsibility to humanize um, the other. And so for Achebe, you can't um, distinguish the moral, your moral obligations from your literary um, aim or literary goal. So both of them are intrinsically um, joined. You, there's, there's no, you know, there's no distinguishing between the two. Thanks very much. Questions people have? 
thoughts. Observations. A shield. Yeah, please. I think so. A very uh, uh, brief question to Karen. What, what did you mean uh, by uh, the last sentence of your, your presentation? Could you expand a little bit on that? Uh, um, when he didn't want to talk about Conrad? Conrad, yeah. And, and what does I, it mean for us here and now? Well, I think because... He, like any writers, you get fed up of being defined by one book or one issue or one essay. Um, you feel you've rehearsed so many times in print, on the radio, in public, um, the same arguments. There's much more to the man than his position on Conrad. And so in front of that particular audience, I think he felt very... Um, very keen to talk about the, the broadness of his career, the complexity of his career, um, without having it pigeonholed just to the issue of Conrad. And, and honestly, quite right too. He was there with a sold out, huge audience in London who actually, I don't think they wanted to hear about Conrad either. I think they wanted to hear about the novels, the essays, the journey, the, the trajectory. I, I, he was right. Thanks a lot. I, I, it was wonderful to hear you all speak. Um, my question is probably directed primarily at OK and Chica, and it's about the use of the English language. I often teach Achebe's um, essay, The African Writer in English Language, with Ngugi Wationgo's essay, um, African Literature. I forget the title, but about whether or not to write in English or in one na one's native language. And that goes to Stephen's question about the how. If you would like to address that, I, I'd be very interested. Thanks. I think that Achebe um, actually articulates the case um, very eloquently. Um, I don't think that Achebe uh, was one who particularly enjoyed the, um, the predicament, historical pr predicament that he faced, which was um, what Ngugi articulated, you know, the sort of the irony that African literature, what announces itself as African literature, is primarily um, written in European languages, right? Um, but that literature is also a product of, of, of that fact, that reality is also a product of an undeniable historical fact that the British came to Nigeria, for example, and put together this behemoth uh, called Nigeria, right? Which is a collection of more than 450 different languages and ethnicities, okay? So our brother, Roland Abiodu, was here earlier, I don't know if he's still here, where he gave a wonderful invocation. But, but Roland is Yoruba, and so the, and I'm Igbo, and you know, he's a man that I admire, but the only language in which he and I can make sense um, to each other, because of this colonial history, is English, right? So the British put us together and established English as, as a language of our education, of the media, and so on and so forth. What I like to see done, and Achebe's position was a very practical position, Achebe <coughs> says, I'm going to use English, okay? But I'm going to use an English that is both still in communion with its ancestral home, but that is informed, shaped by the rhythms and cadences. Not that he said it in this way, this is an, an incompetent or okay candy, but using too many words. Uh, but an, uh, um, an English that will bear the burden of his cultural experience. And, and I think he did it uh, better than any writer that I know. And so he set the example that all of us aspire to. But Achebe himself wrote in Igbo, right? He wrote poems in Igbo, um, he, and he wrote all kinds of other things in Igbo. He gave a lecture, uh, the Denibo lecture, and it was all written in Igbo 
push then if you followed the, uh, the, 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 the you know the controversy I should be one and give this lecture in Igbo and then some people said oh it's not the sort of the scholarly Igbo you know uh, it's not the uh, official orthography and so on and Achebe says you know it's like if you're gonna say to your children come here in your language you you say okay I have to stop and go and learn the official Igbo way of saying it so there are all kinds of problems there but Achebe says write in any language it is necessary to write and he wrote in English but that English in fact when I read Achebe's works things fall apart especially and arrow of God I experienced those novels simultaneously in Igbo and English you know um, the sensibility is Igbo the language becomes accidentally English Achebe said something, I, I can't get the quote right now, where he said, do not be fooled by the fact that, we are writing in, that I'm writing in English, or we're writing in English. Because, but, because I intend to tend do to unheard do of things, unheard of things with it. Yeah. And Achebe is writing Igbo in English. I mean, that's the way I read it. You know, we're discussing Amos Tutuola this, this afternoon as well. And you read Amos Tutuola, and what you're, you read the Power One Dream Card, for example, you're reading Yoruba in English, basically. And I think it is less important, I'm trying to be not to, um, if he wrote just in Igbo, and, um, and he understood the problems, again, due to the histor historicity and due to you know, the burden of colonization and all of that, um, that has made it impossible for writers, um, Africa and Nigeria, apart from Hausa, to write in their local languages. There are, there are no publishing, no, I can't, is there any Igbo publishing company? The there, is, there is not, the structure is not there. And anybody who can read Igbo can read English better. And those who do not read English are probably unable to read Igbo. So who are you writing for then? Even though I must add that that, that is actually a painful reality, it right? Is. Because mm -hmm. as Chika rightly said, when we were in high school, we were punished, we were caned when we spoke Igbo. It was called vernacular. So you had to speak in English. And some schools will fine you. So that kind of deracination where we were uprooted from our, what should belong to our hearts, you know, now became alienated. Uh, is something that we need to correct. In fact, I was discussing this problem with Ngugi Wationgo in Kenya uh, in 2010. Uh, and I said to him, I, I made that point, that uh, any Igbo person who can read Igbo will read English much better. So a novel that would take you five hours to read would take you like three times that to read it in Igbo. But he said to me that the problem is that we have not undergone the formal training in Igbo that we have in, in English. And that's a point that I couldn't argue with. Can I just say something? I mean, it strikes me that you're having read your work, all of you, know, all of you as writers, you're three very different writers, you know, um, doing very different kinds of things. Um, and yet you all have this uh, reverence for Chino Achebe and for his legacy, and it comes into your writing in, in different ways. Uh, I don't think he could have written the novels that, that, you, that you have written, just as you probably couldn't write the novels that he wrote. Uh, and Chica, just something, for example, that strikes me as a curious irony is that um, uh, you have lived in Belgium, right, and have written in Dutch as, as well as in English. Um, and Heart of Darkness is about uh, Belgian colonialism, you know. In fact, you seem to have traveled into the heart of the heart of darkness in your, in your own life. Um, and in that heart of the heart of whiteness, darkness, whichever way you want to look at it, um, uh, you write a story about sex workers on the streets of Antwerp. Not a topic that Chinua Chebi would have written about, you know, <laughs> to say the least. And, and yet, he has done something for your writing, you know, and uh, okay, you may be closest in, in, in the tradition that you're writing into, to, uh, to Chino Achebe's tradition, but Kaz, your writing is very, very different also, kind of um, uh, written in 
uh, fragmented forms set in various times and spaces, different times and places. So you've taken on your own responsibilities of writing, and yet you draw something from Chinua Achebe, and you, you know, it may be that how there is a sense of responsibility and accountability that, that brings you to your own subject matter, and maybe that's how he influences. This has something to do with the question of what tradition actually is, and how it changes, and how a legacy actually transforms over time. I'm not sure if that's a question, but it's an observation. I don't know if you want to, uh, uh, you know, take that up in any form. Chica, did you ever reflect on the fact that you were in, in Belgium, in the heart of... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that I have written about Nigerian sex workers on mm -hmm. the streets of Antwerp. And I read cheap. that essay. It was a yeah. beautiful yeah. essay, and you, yeah. the, the silent minority. Yeah. And I felt challenged to go and write about the women myself as well. Yeah. yeah. There, is a, there is an exchange, actually. Um, because the fact that they were Nigerian, I mean, it's a non-fiction piece, it's a non-fiction essay, but the fact that they were Nigerian is what really fascinated me, and that came directly from Chinua, which... I mean, I think that, I mean, like Tony Morrison says, um, that Achebe opened the door for, for her and for many, you know, writers like her. So I think... I mean, there's, there's a difference between influence and imitation, you know. Um, there would never be another Achebe that couldn't be. And so um, what Achebe has done for me is to give me the license to, you know, write my own stories, tell my own stories. It doesn't matter whether the stories are about sex, Nigerian sex workers in, in Antwerp or about, you know, Nigerians at a wake in Atlanta, you know. Um, Any other questions? Yeah, and um, since um, there, wasn't, there wasn't any time for questions after Michael Thelwell's talk, if anybody has any questions they'd like to put to Michael, a good suggestion. This would be a good time. Michael, if you'd like to answer the questions that were never asked in the first place, you could do that. <laughs> Are there any leftover questions from the previous session? There is one, Professor Lindforce, and it's a great pleasure to to, to see to see you yes. here with us today. I first met Chibi in 1969, when he came to the University of Texas as a spokesman for Biafra. He was raising money for Biafra. And we set him up with television and radio interviews, with a lecture he was going to give at the university, but also he met with some African Get closer to the microphone, I think. He yes. also met with some African literature uh, uh, classes. And what struck me, in his interactions with students and faculty and townspeople was his oral art. He was, he, people have already spoken about his effectiveness as an interviewer, as an interviewee, uh, and, and his, the importance he placed on words. I just want to quote one question he was asked in 1969. Uh, students here will be too young to remember that period, but in the U.S. we had Vietnam, we had riots and the burning of black communities, we had terrible assassinations. Nigeria was going through a traumatic period too. Military coup, counter coup, pogrom, secession, civil war. So writers at that time were being asked why they wrote. What kind of political commitment did they have in their work? What was important to them? So it was inevitable that Chechebe would be asked a question of this kind. And I'd like to read his response because I think it shows his persuasiveness as a speaker, but also shows the kind of oral art he could improvise. 
not with the printed text, but just to articulate his views as clearly as possible. Uh, the question from the audience was, do you believe literature should carry a social or a political message? Some of you may be familiar with this answer. Yes, I believe it's impossible to write anything in Africa without some kind of commitment, some kind of message, some kind of protest. Even those early novels that looked like very gentle recreations of the past, what they were saying, in effect, was that we had a past. That was protest, because there were people who thought we didn't have a past. What we were saying, what we we're doing was to say politely that we did, here it is. Uh, so commitment is nothing new. Commitment runs right through our work. In fact, I should say that all our writers, whether they're aware of it or not, are committed writers. The whole question of life demanded that you should uh, protest, that you should put in a word for your, your history, your traditions, your struggles, your, your religion, and so on. One big message of the many I try to get across is that Africa was not a vacuum before the coming of Europe. That culture was not unknown in Africa. That culture was not brought to Africa by the white world. You would have thought it was obvious that everybody had a past, but there were people who came to Africa and said, you have no history, you have no civilization, you have no culture. Uh, you have no s s religion. Uh, well, you know, we didn't, didn't just drop from the sky. Uh, he also said that uh, Europeans were saying, uh, you're lucky we're here. Now you're hearing about these things for the first time from us. Well, you know, we didn't just drop from the sky. We too had our history, our traditions, our cultures, civilizations. It's not possible for one culture to come to another and say, I am the way, the truth, and the light. There is nothing else but me. If you say this, you are guilty of irreverence or arrogance. You are also stupid. <laughs> this is my concern. A finishing kick. The, 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 the way he phrased this argument to make it quite clear that Africa had been misrepresented in the world. And if you just had common sense, you'd know that Africans were people. There was a message he kept trying to get across five and a half years later here when talking about Conrad. Thank you very much. It's, uh, oh, Chuma, you have a question. Yes. Chuma Nukola. I was trying to save my question since I have a slot for tomorrow, but it seems, uh, seems uh, uh, nobody wants to ask. I'll just ask mine now. Uh, it's a question for everybody, but I think uh, Kwame has already answered this part, really, because it's obvious he's attacking the, the prize. But when Chino Achebe spoke, I think what he really said was he took uh, an accept, a popularly accepted plank, an institutional plank, in that case, um, uh, can, uh, Conrad's position in the canon. He took it and he, within the course of a lecture, he basically uh, upset it. So I'm putting this question to the panel. Uh, what institutional plank, what, taken, what issue which is taken for granted would you select and would you subvert in one paragraph? Simple question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> question. Uh, 
Truma kind of question. And um, Truma is, um, for those of you who don't know, Truma is actually a god uh, in human form. And he's, he's a god in different countries. And, and I'm not joking. I'll tell you the story later. Um, but, um, wow, Truma, they, they, they um, I'm intrigued. I'm not sure this is quite um, something that I'll, I'll take on and, and uh, want to demolish in, in one paragraph, but, but I'm intrigued about the whole uh, evolving idea of social media. Um, and the ways in which um, all the forces that the social media um, have unleashed on us. You know, so on the one hand, giving people voices, you know, democratizing expression and communication, but on the other hand, enabling all kinds of things to be out there, you know, without mediation. So there is, uh, you know, the, the, the immediacy of uh, with which people can spew toxicity right in through every corner of the world. So they. So I'm still wrestling with that, you know, um, and so that's in a sense why my, my involvement in social media and my response to it is still problematic and evolving. Um, so I have, we, we have a mutual friend, uh, Ikide, who proposes, Ikide Ikeolua proposes that uh, the most interesting writing in the world is on social media. He says, forget literature, forget books, there are you know, per se, if you want to know, if you want to read exciting stories, go to social media and to. The ignorance, stupidity? Yes. Okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. So. Pome <laughs> has. I'll, tell, I'll convey that message. <laughs> so he need, we need a microphone to mic so everybody hears it on this. I was going to say, I respect humanity in the generality and have struggled for their freedom. But, and everybody has opinions. And they also have certain sections of their anatomy, which people say that too. But every opinion ain't equal. And every opinion don't deserve expression. And the means for everybody. And the people most quick to express those opinions are the ones who have the least instructed opinions. It's a disaster, that social media. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that sometimes when Ikide says that, that he's being sarcastic, yeah, I think that Ikide courts controversy. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think he really means it. But back to um, Chuma's question, I think that um, the sort of ritual that we read about um, refugees, um, you know, down with, you know, Syrian refugees, and sort of ritual we read about Muslims um, in newspapers. I mean, if you, newspaper comment, uh, comment um, um, sections and, and in the media and um, everywhere else, um, I think that perhaps writers and literature haven't done enough to create empathy for um, refugees, for that person who, you know, is being forced to leave their home, being forced to, to leave behind everything. I don't think anybody leaves home um, of their own volition and, and you know, go through um, sometimes really dangerous um, travel routes like some of the Syrian refugees are doing now because they want to. And I think that perhaps there is space for literature to create that sort of um, empathy where we begin to see the other as just a fellow human being who wants to um, give their children or themselves even the same things that we 
we have. Um, and so perhaps that is the job that is um, us, not for the kind of ritual against Muslims as well. Um, I mean, all you need to do is listen to the apologies to any Republicans here, but listen to the Republican debate sometimes. And, you know, it just makes you lose faith in humanity almost. And the fact that that is happening in the 21st century in a country that is, you know, built on diversity and built on the backs of, <laughs> of other people uh, makes it all the more ironic and all the more tragic. Well, perhaps uh, connected to the social media question, I think we live in a, a, a very narcissistic age of celebrity. Um, and the, the problem is, I think, that uh, the difference between fame and celebrity, Chinua Achebe was a famous man, uh, but he had no desire to be a celebrity. And we're surrounded by a lot of writers who are more interested in being a writer than they are in writing. <laughs>